regrets that we address uh, through our comments and actions um, on policy as well as projects. And of course, our outreach and education that is ongoing to build a constituency and to inspire and energize all of us to be great advocates and, cons and uh, practitioners in conservation. So I'm, I'm really, really excited about tonight and I'm glad you're here. Um, and I'm even more thrilled about um, having an opportunity to hand over this floor uh, to our wonderful moderator. We have an honor to, to bring her up here, Sarah Floynor. Sarah is a true advocate and practitioner of conservation. Um, she has been a trusted um, advisor and supporter of Peace Not Bond for many, many, many years um, and is an invaluable resource to us all that we do. We're so thankful for her being willing to help us out um, and introducing many things about what's happening at Peace Not Bond in the remaining session. So, Sarah. I'm the land director for, for Houston Audubon, and uh, well, aside from fried chicken, my favorite bird is, is the Oscar. Hi, I'm Scott Jones. I'm the new operations director uh, at Houston Audubon. I've been here uh, under five months. Um, my favorite bird has to be the bluebird because that was my grandma's favorite bird. And we just had some visit my house down in the city the other day for the first time. Here, but um, I think uh, my favorite 
public access to our sanctuaries and increasing that public access. We're also actively restoring the habitat for birds and wildlife. So we've been working diligently over the last nine years now um, in getting Smith Oaks in particular, um, removing a lot of non-native non invasive species like Chinese privet and Chinese tallow, and we are almost done. Thank goodness. Um, wow. I, I hear the word chainsaws, and we have two seasonal technicians and our full-time conservation specialist, uh, who's new this year. His name is Wyatt Egelhoff. We'll, you also probably meet, we'll probably meet him during spring migration in High Island. Uh, but we're getting to a good point where we can move on to the rest of our sanctuaries and focus more of our efforts on restoring additional habitat for migrating birds. And this is why you, keep, you, you think of me as the coast in High Island because this is where I'm always at. Um, and this will be the new office. So this is the Clint and Mary Francis Morse Field Station. Uh, if, if you remember the tropical birding house across the, across the street from Boy Scout Woods, well, this is now in its place. Uh, this will serve as office for staff members, um, a place for volunteers to use to store their stuff. We can have outreach events, programs, and it's, it's really coming along. So this is an interior view and we'll be ready during spring, this spring migration to invite, invite the public in for enjoyment of the new structure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to hand it over to Scott. Thank you, Kelsey and Scott. And thank you, Kelsey and Pete. And I'll say that Scott um, is the operations director, but some of you may not know, he also handles Thank you. Um, yes, I've, I've got quite a background in dealing with advocacy issues um, at the Galveston Bay Foundation and prior to that at the Galveston Bay Estuary Program. So um, I enjoy uh, trying to minimize or eliminate negative impacts from the way we live and all our structures. But the good news is that we have an advocacy committee and I see John Bard is sitting here tonight. So we have an ad advocacy committee that can help us along with our partners from other nonprofits, and then we've got, a, as you can tell, we've got a really good staff and management that have a lot of knowledge and they've been working on these issues a long time. So it's true we get a ton of requests to um, give our feedback on different items, whether it's the coastal barrier, and I'll have a slide here in just a minute, but the coastal barrier, also known as the Ike Dike, that's a big one right now. But then wind farms, those are, we're getting, um, a lot of information about new wind farms coming in. And I know I just spoke with a company uh, back in uh, early November. They came, um, it's um, Stout Clean Energy, and they are proposing something called the Bayou Breeze Project, which is down in Chambers and Jefferson County. And because of the location with all the migratory birds and other birds, certainly that raises concerns to direct uh, impacts on birds and then indirect impacts on habitat. So Kelsey and Pete will also be involved in giving feedback to any company. We want to stay engaged with them or any other type of company so we can try to get out in front of issues and get out and tell them, let them know the questions that we and birders are going to be asking to make sure we can protect the birds. So that's, in, that's one example. Um, another example of something that's going on right now with all the growth and all the buildings, we also have the issue bird impacts with all the glass and I know that Houston Audubon has been invited in conjunction with um, ABC with um, the American uh, Bird Conservancy, uh, Gabriel, uh, who's standing in the back. He's working on some comments on the design of the new Hall High School down in Galveston because it has the potential to have a lot of impact. So like with wind farms, as far as location and um, type of uh, safety features they can have to try to minimize impacts. If we can help give good input on the design of the glass, the size of the glass, and other safety factors up front, we can help them. So we'll continue to be engaged in that as well. Um, 
And I know that uh, Kelsey and I will be in uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife headquarters at the beginning of February um, to uh, work with um, other nonprofits down there um, in the conservation, um, bird conservation coalitions. So that's the type of interaction we have. Um, as far as the coastal barrier, I don't know how much y'all know about the coastal barrier, but I've been working on it now for over 10 years. You can see the map behind you, basically. If you don't know, it's going to be a storm protection, storm surge protection system running all the way down the length of Bolivar Peninsula and not all the way down uh, Galveston Island. And what you can see here will be a series of earthen, um, earthen uh, levees and then a big double sanding system. But what concerns us most at Houston Audubon is what's going on around Bolivar Roads and specifically right by our um, Bolivar Flats uh, sanctuary. And I'm going to show you this picture here real quick.
lots of great communities, um, lots of diverse people coming out to see us of all ages. So I'm real excited about all that's going on in education. And we've always had this commitment to provide exemplary education programs and outdoor experiences that create this lasting environmental ethic and inspire young and old to conserve the birds and the resources of Texas. That's something that's near and dear to the heart of my education staff. And we do that, like I, like I showed you, in great diverse ways, not just um, outreach programs to the schools and, and trips to our centers, but virtual, Zooming all over the world, actually, programs for all ages, underserved, rural areas and urban. There's a lot um, going on, and you guys all have a part of that. As donors and supporters, you make it all happen. Um, we're impacting lives across the board and hopefully raising um, youngsters to make that commitment to make informed decisions and foster responsible behavior, um, conservation actions for the future. But again, the impact is far and wide. And we always start with awareness and the Rapture Center and, and what's happening at Edith, Edith Elmore is a great place to just get that spark in somebody. People get so excited to meet the birds or just be taken, taken on a trail walk through the wonderful forest at Edith Elmore. From awareness, we work towards appreciation, really going deeper and um, making that lifelong uh, commitment and desire to be a part of the natural community and, and make good decisions. And then, of course, we want people to take action. And there's lots of great ways that people get involved with Youth Synodabon through action, and a big part of that is um, supporting through the education. So our road ahead in 2023, you know, we know we can all make a difference together for birds in our community. Um, can't do it by ourselves. And like I said, we're the staff, the board, donors, um, members, community, we, it all takes us, it takes the team. And we are very fortunate to have such a fantastic team at Houston Audubon, and I'm proud to be here. So I'll turn it back over to Sarah. All right, thank you, Marianne. Um, thank you to all of our panelists. We're gonna have our second lightning round. Uh, Marianne, you can keep the microphone and we'll just pass it down quickly. I don't want you all to think too much about this. This is really about what comes to mind first. But when I ask you, is there a sanctuary, a Houston Audubon sanctuary that you really love? Maybe it's a favorite. Um, what sanctuary is that and why? And this is quick, quick, rapid, rapid round. So start with you, Marianne. Winter's Bayou. If you've ever been to Winter's Bayou, it's, um, the only way I can describe it is enchanting. It is, it's like stepping back into another world. I'm new, so it's Edith Elmore. <laughs> it's been a couple of decades since I was able to get out to High Island, but it, oh, I'm sorry, I messed up. The Raptor Center. <laughs> I got to see the Raptor Center and uh, visit with Marianne and Shelby and, and the critters um, a couple weeks ago, so no, that was really nice too. But I can just walk outside my office when I need to get away from the computer, so I'm gonna stick with Edith Elmore right there. <laughs> Well, I would have to say Smith Oaks. Um, those oak trees are some of the biggest oak trees that I've ever seen. And aside from the mosquitoes and the biting flies, yes, it's, it's a magical place too. A lot of happening. Well, I have a great love for High Island. That's how I was introduced to Houston a couple of years ago. My favorite sanctuary, which I've only visited once, and I hope to visit a million times more, is the Carolyn Ray Davis Sanctuary, the one that we're going to be doing painting in. I am obsessed with it. It is beautiful. It's um, actually got oil pipelines going through it, and so it's got this prairie that was just kind of because they have to mow on top of the pipelines, and it was beautiful the last time we were there. It was probably what like three or four feet high, the grasses, and so they're you know up to my waist, and there's pollinators everywhere, and so you have that prairie in conjunction with the big Columbia bottomland uh, forest. It was just amazing. And I'm really excited to get to share it with more people. So if you ever want to go out, let me know. Maybe I'll take you. Kelsey, let's keep the mic with you. I wondered about, you mentioned some monitoring efforts, and I wondered about um, the urban monitoring. And specifically, many of you may have attended one of our urban bird surveys, or maybe you go regularly. I know some of you actually organize the urban bird survey. 
18. When I worked at Houston Audubon, I think we had like six or eight. So the program has expanded. And many people would ask me, well, what are you doing with all the data you're collecting? Right? It's been ongoing for years. Um, and I think you have something to report about that. Uh, can you share a little bit more? Yeah, so we do have 18. So there's a bunch of people here that participate regularly. And thank you, you make all that possible. And even people like Skip, who have been doing it for decades now for us. So we really appreciate that. Um, I am really excited to get into the data for this. So we've been doing these surveys for over a decade in some of these places. And so we have decades long data on bird use and changes in these, uh, in these habitats. And in conjunction with that, we also have land use changes that we can look at with these kind of bird abundance changes as well. So I'm really excited to delve into. Um, we will be hiring somebody very soon to help work with all of that community science data, um, which we should be able to get reports out to you guys and also to the greater Houston community and also potentially the greater scientific community, depending on our findings here. So that data is being used. Um, if you would like to participate in one of these bird surveys, it's just birding. So if you like to go birding and you want to do it for a more concentrated science effort, sign up for one of these. Like uh, Sarah said, we've got 18, so they're all over the Houston area, all the way up to the woodlands and all the way down to Galveston. So we've got one at Moody Gardens as well. Um, so if you live anywhere near here, uh, you can participate in one of these. And most of them meet once a month, and you go on a set route to go breeding. Uh, the leader will submit those observations to Houston Ottawa, and then we get to use all of that data. So we do them monthly. Each one is uh, theoretically goes every single month. So. Thank you, Kelsey. And I'd like to ask a follow-up question of Scott. Scott, um, Houston Audubon has so many things it could do to help birds. Um, so many threats to address, so many land acquisitions, um, so many possibilities, and I know we get a lot of requests for help. How do you prioritize, um, how do you pick which issues that Houston Audubon really wants to advocate for? I think it, it gets back to the fact that we do have an advocacy committee have our very good staff. So when we get requests, um, we need to kind of weigh how urgent is this matter. Um, do we need to start getting in on the planning now? Or can we wait a little bit? And if there's something else that's a higher priority, uh, we'll be able to uh, prioritize that way. Um, it just depends on the, the scope of the impact, how broad it's going to be. Um, level of partners we can have to help us um, and that way we can kind of divide and conquer if we have to um, we can have others help us on certain issues um, but I think another big part is the other nonprofits that we work with such as American Bird Conservancy or getting into issues of habitat like working with Body Preservation Association or um, the Houston Area uh, Waterkeeper I'm sorry to change your name remember from the old days um, so I think that's that helps us. So we'll have to take in all all the information about this. We'll, we basically, I think we never say no on engaging in the issue. So there's a huge list, um, and then you know we just have to basically prioritize it. Maybe sometimes the meetings that come about, um, we have public engagement opportunities. We'll be able to fit that into our calendar. So this is a lot of spinning plates in there. Thanks, Scott. And I'd like to open it up to all of our panelists um, in thinking about the strategic planning process that Houston Audubon is embarking upon. Um, I don't know if any of you all have read that book, Good to Great. It's a wonderful book about organizational management, what makes a truly great organization. But the writer suggests that you need to look at what makes your organization unique. What is your organization doing that no one else is doing or no one else can do? I was just curious, maybe just one or two of y'all might share. What do you think makes Houston Audubon unique? Um, I, I think I would say, um, number one, we are passionate about our mission, and we are mission driven, and um, we stay focused on that mission, and we're very um, thoughtful, and I can't think of what the other word would be with our um, time, with our funding, 
start to finish. And I think another u unique position that Houston Audubon is, is in is just the fact that we have such a great diversity of habitat that we manage on the upper Texas coast, from piney woods to coastal marshes and everything in between and urban centers. It's a lot. Um, I don't know of any other organization that juggles 17 sanctuaries, um, spanning 11 counties, um, and such diverse, diverse habitats. And we do it for the birds and we do it for you guys. And I just think that makes us very, very unique and we stood the test of time. Um, and I, I think from my background at Galveston Bay Foundation and Galveston Bay Estuary Program, the difficulty there is people can't get really connected with the bay. At least most Houstonians can't get really connected with the bay. A lot of them just drive over to the bay. Whereas we have all this diverse habitat that Marianne just mentioned, but then in all of our backyards and all of our local park areas, we have birds. So everybody can, there's an opportunity for everybody to really appreciate birds. So I think that is a positive thing. Um, so I'm glad for that. And yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, I'm a, I will build upon what Mary and, and Scott have said. Um, being a nonprofit, being an accredited land trust, um, we can take on some of these projects that other people can't. Um, we can single ourselves in a meeting, let's start a bird friendly communities program, and then just start. Uh, we can see a piece of land for sale that has excellent habitat value and say, let's, let's try and go get it. Uh, so I think that's unique, um, and that's really what's made Houston Audubon what it is today. You want to add? Yeah, maybe you said two or three, but we'll just go for all four. Um, I think something that I have found really special about Houston Audubon is how localized it is. Um, I know that it's a technically a regional kind of section of Audubon, but we have a really far reach, and we're also really able to reach like physical single people within that area. I think a lot of bird conservation organizations are, are very large, often on the national scale and sometimes the state scale. And I think that they kind of miss some of that really local connection. And I found that really special about Houston Audubon, that like through Marianne's work and through Feet on the Coast, uh, through some of our conservation initiatives, that we can really engage with individual people on kind of a local level. And so I think as far as like bird conservation organizations go, that's one of the things that makes Houston Audubon really special, is that we can really engage with people. Thank you all. And I will add, and I'm thinking of this all on the spot, but what makes Houston Audubon unique in my eyes is, um, is a community of doers. And to the point where there's almost been moments where I've criticized Houston Audubon for not promoting itself enough. They, they spend, we spend more effort on doing the actual work than on promoting the work we're doing. And we need to do both, but I don't know, I'm proud of doers. I like doers. And Houston Audubon are doers. Um, okay, thank you. And Pete, I wanted to have one follow-up question for you. Um, you have a slide on habitat restoration maybe one of the most important things we can do to help birds. And um, I wondered about native plants in that piece, and particularly what's happening on the coast um, with the nursery. <laughs> well, um, every, um, um, if you don't know about our native's nursery at, at Edith Elmore, which was started some years ago by Glow Anna, again, one of those programs someone can just come up with and we just go ahead and do it. Um, we have expanded the Natives Nursery uh, down to the coast. So we have a new coastal Natives Nursery that is based out of our Coastal Operations Center, which is just on the left side of Old Mexico Road as you're on your way to Smith Oaks. And the plan is to be able to grow out more of the restoration mat plant material so that we can use those, those for our sanctuaries. Um, okay, let's do um, let's do a lightning round. Um, okay, what is your specific favorite part of your job? Help us get a flavor of what life is like for you, and be honest.
our surveys and our monitoring, and of course, darn, I have to go down and help Pete with something in High Island. Oh look, I've got time to burn for a few hours, you know, kind of a thing. So that's probably my favorite part, um, getting to go uh, birding and getting to, and really getting to introduce people to birding and lead people in birding, because that's always super fun, getting people lifers and things like that. Um, just in our region, it's really exciting to get new people into birding. I think one of my favorite parts, um, aside from the job itself, uh, is just seeing the diversity of wildlife. I, I take it for granted every day when I ride the ferry that I see dolphins almost every single day. Um, and every time I'm at Smith Oaks, I can see alligators and I can see, I've seen bobcats and river otters and, and you know all this great wildlife that you may not see you know, in, in a normal day in the city. So that's that's pretty special to me. So <clears throat> my background is in aquatic and estuarine science. So, um, but I do love my birds. I'm a very amateur birder. So for me, um, I've just been amazed at the wealth of knowledge of my fellow staff. And I'm a scientist, so we're all kind of geeky. And I got some really good, good bird geeks I can work with, and I'm just amazed at their knowledge of the birds and the habitat. You have to meet Wyatt for sure. Mm -hmm. Speaking of knowing birds, that guy is something. So that's my favorite part. Um, I think I have two. Um, one of my favorite things is early mornings, um, getting to the Raptor Center super early when the sun's just coming up and experiencing the birds that are on the property along this very magical meander of Sims Bayou. Um, it's a really special place to be in the morning, and even though it's only an acre and a half, the bird life is fantastic. Um, and of course, early morning, uh, greeting all of our education ambassadors. And I, but I think my other favorite thing is working with my fantastic education team, Shelby, Amber, and Vicki, and brainstorming and getting really creative in how we can um, develop create and then um, implement and deliver outstanding educational programs with the small resources that we have, the small spaces that we have. Um, I love creating curriculum and, and getting creative with my team, so that's something I look forward to every single day. Thank you, and just a couple more questions for me and then we'll turn it over to you all if you wanna dive into any topics in particular, but Marianne, so you have been at Easton Audubon for a number of years, and I was curious how you've seen Houston Audubon grow, and what stands out to you as different? How is the education program different today than it was 20 years ago? How is Houston Audubon different now than it was 20 years ago? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> labor. 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 Oh my gosh. Um, I mean, when I started, there were just three of us in the office. Com at, you know, and, and a lot of, well, a lot of volunteers. We still have, you know, volunteers are um, our heartbeats for the organization. We couldn't do it without our volunteers and our members. Um, and just to see the, um, same faces and the people who have stuck with us all these years, that's really special. As we've grown, as we've added land and sanctuaries and staff and been able to reach out um, in a better, more intentional way into our communities and really, I think one of the best, the greatest things that I've seen change is, is our intentional work to reach communities across our entire region and make birding and birds available to anybody and everyone. And the bird surveys are a big part of that. And, and the Bird Family Communities Initiative, our education programs, obviously. Um, we really want to reach all four corners uh, and everything in, betwe in between. And it takes, takes a lot of time and effort and staff. And um, as we've grown, both in numbers of staff and in numbers of acres, our outreach and our um, impact has grown equally and abundantly. So, um, there's a lot more. I, mean, I, I know you could go on and on. It is just so interesting to see how the organization has. We went from dial up to like real internet. <laughs> <laughs> there was no Raptor Center. There is no Raptor Center. Um, okay. I started out talking about the wounds we feel when we 
see the damage being caused to the earth, and it can be pretty depressing uh, if we let it. I would like to hear, well, I'd actually like to invite the audience to just think in your own mind for a moment about the things that give you hope um, when thinking about the natural world, the landscape, the earth, the animals. You know, what gives you hope? What are those feel-good moments that you have that keep you going, keep you positive, keep you engaged? Um, and you know, I hope you hold those with you. That's what, that's what I have to do. And I'd like to turn it over to our panelists and just say, do you have any hopeful um, words of wisdom or feel-good moments that you've experienced at Houston Audubon um, that you would like to share with us before we open it up to our audience? Um, I'll just, I'll, I'll say this, and then you can stop. Um, and this sounds weird, but um, it's really special at the Rapture Center when people come and they get to, to see a particular bird up close for the first time that maybe they have admired or really loved their whole lives, and um, the tears start to flow. We've had grown men, you know, <laughs> bodybuilders just weeping when they birds, a bird that they have loved and admired their whole lives, a particular kind of bird. And then I, I remember it was about um, maybe eight months ago, this family traveled all the way from Mexico with their daughter who had a um, terminal disease, and she had gotten to the point where she could do a little, you know, could do some traveling, um, and they brought her to Houston to the Rapture Center to meet um, owls, because owls were her favorite bird, and believe me, everybody was crying. <laughs> they were happy tears. Um, she was, it was a very special moment, and um, hugs from kids that we teach, um, and when we have kids come back grown with their kids, <laughs> it's very special for, um, I guess for me, because then they're so long. Um, <laughs> they're the um, But they're, they come back and they say how much they were impacted by what we were able to do today. Well, I haven't been here for too long, but I will just go back to, I grew up in Houston and Southwest Houston in the uh, 60s and 70s, and so I've seen how it can do much better. I mean, I remember what the air was like and what the water was like and the bayous and ditches I'd play in. Um, but we didn't have good wastewater treatment. So I know we can do better in our technology. And but seeing the air so much cleaner and the water cleaner, considering all the population growth we've had, that gives me a lot of hope. I do know that with all the population growth and all the structures that can impact habitat and birds, that we're going to have to keep reaching people. So when I can step outside the office at Edith L. Moore and I see all the kids running around in the groups, that gives me much more hope. Because um, I work with a lot of kids in other capacities and I think they're wonderful and I think if we just keep reaching them we're going to be good. Well I would say um, you know having having been based in High Island the last nine years and started work on Smith Oaks removing you know doing habitat restoration removing non-native invasive species I look around and I see areas that we cleared six years ago four years ago, three years ago, and I've watched the progression of the native fauna, or native flora, excuse me, um, come back because we're, we're actively managing the habitat and keeping those invasive species down. And, and particularly in spring migration, when you see visitors um, and they stop you on the trail and they just tell you, you guys are doing a great job tap you on the shoulder because you're wearing a staff shirt. They just say, I just wanted to say thank you. You know, that seeing areas where there were few birds before, but now habitat has come back to what it should be. Um, it gives me hope that maybe they're doing something right. Um, I think for, in general, I just like to think about how adaptable some species are. We're losing a lot of species, um, and it can be really depressing at some times to see that. But I, grackles, I'm just going to say, are one of my absolute favorite birds. I love grackles, and watching them like open a trash bag, like they can, they can open a tight knotted bag with their beaks and pull French fries.
right now and go dip them in, and they'll go dip them in like parking lot ketchup. Like it's amazing. <laughs> like getting to watch them is one of the coolest parts of I think birding is getting to watch birds adapting to different things that humans do. And so that's kind of general. Uh, for Houston Audubon really is I think the global impact that, that we were having is really special and I think that that really gives me hope. Both like on a continental scale of our habitat being stopover points and so important to our birds, but then also um, I guess it was a little about, a little over a year before I started here. I was at High Island. I would zoom around to the hooks, just kind of doing my thing, and I took a moment to look around. I was in Boy Scout Woods, you know, on that prairie uh, dock over there, and there were so many people from different parts of the world that were enjoying Boy Scout Woods, and that was really impactful. And I remember going around and I'm coming back down, um, kind of that boardwalk. I'm like, have you seen Bunny Bunnies? And I'm like, yeah, they're everywhere. I'm like, we're in Texas. What are you talking about? And they're like, oh, well, I literally came here from India to see a painted bunny. And that really gets me that Aww. when people want to see birds, they go to Houston Audubon sanctuaries from all over the world. And I think that gives me a lot of hope that we're, we're making a really big impact. Well, join me in thanking and honoring these wonderful people who do very hard work every day. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, if there are any, you can direct them to one of our panelists or to the group as a whole, and they'll figure out how best to answer it. So if you do have a question, um, Sam, let's kick it off with you. So the field station, <clears throat> you know, it has several functions, or it will have several functions. One is a place for volunteers to use. Um, you know, right now our volunteers are using their own their own laptops, their own office space, spending spending their time, and hopefully this this will be a place where they can have some of the office space that they're of their own. They don't have to high change in the trunk of their cars, you know, it'll be secure in the field station. Um, it'll also be a place for the public to use. So the screened in porch that is going to wrap around um, and overlook the barnyard next door, which is the little native remedy, remedy prairie piece that we, we've established. Um, it'll help us with outreach, it'll help us with education programming. Um, we plan to we actually have a meeting on this next week of what all we want to do programming wise in the field station for the spring. Um, so we can have classes, we can bring in local, the local school uh, in High Island. And then also use it as a place where visiting researchers can come do research on our properties and you know bring samples back to the field station and process them. Office space for staff. Um, you know, it'll be a place where we can also have donor events, or it'll be an event space that'll kind of touch on all aspects of Houston Houston Audubon's goals. I'm going 
Thank you. Uh, great to the meeting. Uh, my name is Skip Allman. I'm on board of directors. The Houston Audubon is in the process of setting up a pilot program to co-brand uh, bird interest with professional companies, tropical birding or visiting. These trips are going to be casual birding. Seven days long. Uh, there'll be typically you'll stay in one place, possibly two at the most. Number three is uh, the trips will be relaxed. Nobody's getting up at four o'clock in the morning and driving you for three and a half hours in order to see a bird. Uh, you may just get up at four o'clock in the morning, but that's that's uh, and so there'll be no strenuous hiking. We have a question from Elaine O'Sullivan uh, from our Facebook Live. She says, does Houston Audubon have any partnerships now or in the future to engage college-age students, older teens, or early 20s? College-age, older teens, or early 20s? Engagement opportunities. Um, I'll just say that I think we we do offer numerous opportunities. Of course, our seasonal technicians are college students down on the coast. And in the past, we've had summer internships um, at the Rapture Center in southeast Houston. Our summer camps could not happen without fantastic high school volunteers from Stratford High, Memorial High, um, 
St. Agnes and a couple other schools in the East Belmore area. And those, college, those um, high schoolers are tremendous. They come back every year and they love it. Um, we do educational programming. I was just at Kincaid with their high school, uh, juniors and seniors the other day doing programs. So um, there's lots of ways to get involved. Our scouting, Eagle Scouts, um, are another connection that we have with older youth. And it's something that we want to continue growing in the future, for sure. Thank, Thank you, Marianne. Marianne. Any other questions? Yes. Um, the Webster Eagles are there on their eggs. Um, I don't know, I haven't heard any reports about the one on Gessner and Briar Forest, but there's a pair that are seen regularly on the bird survey at Fiorenza Park, which is out in um, Ailey, off of West Park Tollway and Eldridge. So they're there pretty much every day. And the McGregor Eagles that Houston Audubon um, was very uh, made a big was a bit played a big role in protecting their nest when U of H was building their medical school, mm -hmm. um, and we were able to kind of intercede and make sure that the school went through eagle training and all that good stuff. Um, how much time do we have? I'll go fast. So the eagles stay during the build. Um, we monitor the nest almost daily, and they came back um, last year. And it was the same pair. The, the female has a significant scar on her beak, so we could identify both of them. And then um, last year, it was right before a very bad, we had a very bad storm, and for some reason, they didn't go to their, their old nest by the U of H Medical School last year. They moved back to a historic nest in the Parkwood area down south of McGregor. And that nest that they had built and, and used by the medical school for probably over 10 years, um, completely collapsed and fell during the storm. So they instinctively knew that something was wrong with that nest. So they had moved down about two miles down the way to um, another location where there had been eagles before. So they are there. Um, we've had quite the drama because the female, her name was Scarlett, um, <laughs> Rhett waited and waited. And <laughs> Park right above um, the MLK statue every day in the park for her, and she never came back this past fall. And then a young four-year-old showed up, and he was like, "Okay." Um, <laughs> and this four-year-old, I wish I, I should have put a picture in there, is huge. I've shown some of you pictures. She's a massive bird, and so he's probably scared of her. Anyway, <laughs> so they kind of got cozy, and then. Um, he took her down to the nest down, down on McGregor. Well, Scarlett returned. Oh. And, oh, no. Um, there was a little bit of a tussle, and the four year old left. And so I was like, oh, Scarlett's back. It, it's a bird that really is an amazing bird because of this scar on her beak. It's, um, and we've watched it heal and get better over the years. Anyway, well, something happened, and the four year old came back. And if you saw pictures of how big this four-year-old is, it's it's scary. I know that, you know, Brett, he's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so they are active at the nest every day, um, bringing turf, bringing sticks, so she'll probably be laying eggs any day now, and they hunt along the bayou, and when we're out there on, on weekends, um, we, uh, my husband and I, it's a crowd. We get the bike groups and people walking down um, along the hiking bike trails, and usually we end up having this huge crowd of people talking to them about eagles and and, and the cormorants and the pelicans and the osprey. And um, we just had a reporter for K, from KTRK two days ago send us pictures from um, an eagle happily fit, fishing in a detention pond somewhere in Klein, and he's like, "Is this an eagle?" <laughs> yeah, that's an eagle. Um, so they are. Uh, comeback species, and our job is to keep those bayous and detention ponds uh, clean because they they need those and we need them. So the four-year-old, I know, it's very confusing. <laughs> the four-year-old came back and.
and Scarlett disappeared. So we don't know what happened to her. I don't know um, of any, she hasn't been in any of the rehab centers or anything like that. So um, it was, you know, a little divorce. Something happened. Brett got caught out. <laughs> he was cheating. And, uh, and this four-year-old is just huge. I'd be scared of her. So. <laughs> Yeah, she could possibly turn up somewhere else. So, you know, they come here to nest in the winter and then they move north. Um, a lot of them move north for the summer and they feed in the summer. So it's exciting. People um, call us all the time about seeing, seeing eagles. Amanda, where you, you saw one on break, probably, probably the four year old or, or rep. Because they go up to um, TSU, they go over to Herman Park, and they have quite a good range. So don't be surprised. Um, no, not yet, but she's a, she's a very interesting bird, and she enjoys hanging upside down. <laughs> and I have thousands of pictures of her hanging upside down in the ocean. She's just swaying, kind of, you know, like, that's her technique for breaking sticks. Like most people, like, just crash into a branch and break it off and take it, and she'll crash, and then she'll hang upside down for, like, long periods of time. <laughs> Tales of Love. Yeah. I don't know if anyone's read it, but about this wonderful community in Central Park that follows these nesting red-tailed hawks and all the, the daily drama. <laughs> uh, sounds a lot like that. Um, we're shifting into the end of the program, and uh, we have a couple of special treats. Um, first is, I'm not sure if anyone else at Houston Audubon has two complete sets of High Island patches. Am I the only one? Oh, we have a couple more back there. Um, it's a long story how I do, but it has come about two full sets. Um, and we have um, a brief interview with Linda Feltner, who designed the Highland Patches, and so you all might not know her, um, so we're gonna show a brief clip with her. But before we do that, uh, Marianne, we have a special, a new special guest, right? Oh. Listen back to the whole time.
short clip from the entire video, which I think we'll have on our website so you can watch the whole interview and get to know um, Linda a little bit more. So. Well, we are excited about 2023. Water brush racing the beautiful patch that you designed for us. We are grateful for your years of service, even though you live far away in Arizona. Um, it's a really wonderful partnership. Art and nature go hand in hand together. And I thank you for joining us. Uh, this evening and telling us a little bit about your journey and sharing your art with us each year. And I think, like you said, now maybe people will take pause and look a little deeper at the patch and see the story uh, behind it. So thank you, Linda. Thank you She, she talks about that in a longer interview, which is, I think, about six or so minutes. So definitely check that out on our website or on Facebook um, to learn more about her and her art and how grateful we are for her help every year. And the High Island patches, you can purchase them here. I think right after the meeting, you can go ahead and purchase and get, pick up your patch. If you already ordered one, um, it will be sent to you. Um, you can also order them online or just when you vote on the High Island. So those are your options. And they I sold out last year. I see. They they sell out. So. We're pretty sure we're not going to sell out this year. We ordered extra. So with that, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank Helen for leading this wonderful organization and for the board of directors the Board of Advisors, all the volunteers, all the staff members, um, all the donors.